Lake Griffin, Florida. An eerie calm masks a sinister threat. There was things going on you weren't sure of. Every town has its secrets. Some have their nightmares. You would just see them floating. And they said only a few hundred died, and I think it was more like in the thousands. Something strange is turning this once peaceful wilderness into the stuff of horror films. Changing the lake's residents into empty, mindless shells, incapable of controlling their own bodies. In other words, zombies. First, it just seems like an ordinary death, a chance discovery amongst the tangled reeds. A bloated body, floating belly up, exposed to the elements. There is very little to alert suspicions, until a second corpse is found, and then a third. Their putrefying bodies fringing the lake, washed to the side like unwanted debris. There was times I would go out on the lake and be able to find 10 alligators in a half a mile. And these were adult, large alligators. They, you know, weren't little juveniles. They were 10, 12, 14 foot long, huge alligators dead, floating around on the lake. Something is terribly wrong at Lake Griffin. The reports immediately grab the attention of Florida Fish and Wildlife. Alan Woodward is assigned to get down to the lake and check it out for himself. He already has his suspicions. Gunshot wounds to the head is the most common thing you would see. Also, we look for tails missing in case people were poaching alligators for the tail meat. The other thing that could happen is people um, hitting alligators with boats. You can usually see propeller scars on the back. But the corpses tell a different story. No signs of trauma, propeller scars, no scars, fairly intact. None of these things were observed on any of the dead alligators. But all is not what it seems. Not all of the alligators are dead. Lake Griffin lies in the very heart of Florida, about 80 kilometers northwest of Orlando. It is home to one of the largest alligator populations in the state. And it's the only one of Florida's 8,000 lakes that show the bizarre spate of deaths. Rotting, bloated corpses are turning up along the shoreline. Trapped in the reeds and out in the open water amongst the floating vegetation. So, a select team of investigators from 13 agencies is assembled. Among them, a project coordinator, Alan Woodward, Jeff Elledge of the Water Management District, pathologist Scott Terrell, and Dale Honeyfield from the Northern Appalachian Research Laboratory in Pennsylvania. It's their job to track down the killer. It's a team effort, it really is. No one person is more important than the other because we've got to put all this information together to try and rule out things that it is not and rule in things that it could be. 
They begin by observing the alligator's behavior for themselves. We noticed alligators that showed poor equilibrium. In other words, they, were, they had a hard time riding themselves in the water. They listed to one side or another. Some of them had trouble keeping their heads above water. There was some speculation that they were uh, eventually drowning because they could not keep their heads above water. The scientists are mystified. What could cause this amphibious creature to drown? Alligators spend their lives in and around water. It's their lifeblood. They die without it. They use it as a sanctuary to keep cool, to mate, to hunt. They can remain submerged for two hours, but the zombie gators are struggling even to swim. They float listlessly in the water or lie motionless on the bank. The first thing you notice is that they were unresponsive. Often, they thought the alligator was dead on the shoreline. Only sporadic twitches give away that they're still alive. Alligator behavior like this has never been seen before. This top predator is no longer able to move, let alone kill. It was a strange, they, they looked like they were drugged almost. Strange. There are no external signs of injury, no obvious clues. So a team of pathologists goes to work on the bodies. At the beginning, in any case like this where we don't know what's going on, we start with a complete examination. We leave no stone unturned. So really, we, we're examining this animal from from snout to tail. The dissection is done systematically. Starting with the skin, we move internally into the internal organs of the animal. We're taking pieces and parts of everything that animal can give us. By examining the inside of the animal, Dr. Scott Terrell hopes to find a clue as to the cause of death. But Terrell isn't sure exactly what he's looking for. We're taking diagnostic samples from heart, lung, liver, kidney, intestinal contents. We're dividing those tissues up into a, a variety of different containers so that we can test them for viruses, bacteria, toxins, pesticides. And from there, we can try to make a diagnosis. Terrell examines the corpses meticulously but in every animal, the organs appear to be healthy. Despite his best efforts, there is still no obvious indication why these animals have died. What we were seeing were adult, healthy animals with not much, we couldn't see much when we were doing a post-mortem exam. A lot of the initial tests were coming back negative. We weren't finding consistent bacterial infections. We didn't find any evidence of a virus. We weren't finding much. Sure enough, none of the tests are positive. None of the organs seem diseased, the immune system is uncompromised, and Terrell finds no signs of trauma or foreign bodies. The corpses are telling them nothing. The investigators can see only one other course of action. They must get an affected animal before it dies. They're going to have to go hunting for zombies. The operation has to be carried out in the dead of night. This is when the alligators are most active, easier to find because of their eye reflections and least wary of an approaching boat. The investigators head out to catch one of the zombies.
alligators are stealth hunters, lying motionless and often submerged, making the task doubly difficult. Then they see one. They have to make this shot count. A healthy alligator would normally thrash around at this point. After all, it's just had a two-inch barb stabbed into its neck. But this animal hardly seems to notice. Things are getting stranger and stranger. They showed very lethargic behavior. They didn't try and avoid the boat as we approached them, which is very unusual for wild alligators, particularly on Lake Griffin, and they put up very little fight. But still, the team takes no chances. They secure the alligator's jaws before bringing it on board. This is a zombie alligator, and no one can tell just what it will do next. The investigators follow protocol. They place tape over the eyes and jaws to keep the alligator subdued. Because what they have to do next is really tricky. They're going to attempt to take a blood sample from deep behind the alligator's head, past the vertebrae, and through two centimeters of muscle and tough skin. The blood here, in the cervical sinus of the spinal vein, is in much greater quantity. The corpses have told them nothing, but the blood sample of a live animal may give clues to their unusual behavior. These precious 20 milliliters of blood could reveal the identity of the killer. Mark Merchant of McNeese University in Louisiana is an expert on alligator blood and is conducting tests on its resistance to disease and infection. We grew these microorganisms in culture in our laboratory and we would challenge them with different amounts of alligator blood products to test what the effects were. Merchant laces blood with bacteria and viruses to observe the reactions of the alligator's immune system. What we found uh, was amazing. We found that uh, we tried 23 different types of bacteria and the uh, alligator blood had uh, negative growth effects on all 23 types. The alligator blood kills everything that Merchant and his team infected with. Yet in some ways this is not surprising. Alligators are constantly battling with each other, inflicting massive injuries. Alligators can be extremely aggressive toward members of their own species. And sometimes during these fights, they uh, inflict serious injuries on one another, including loss of entire limbs. The resulting wounds are open to constant infection from stagnant water, saliva, parasites, and foreign bodies. But these enormous injuries heal most often without serious infection. They could never survive these sorts of encounters unless their bodies were extremely resistant to infection. Although Merchant and his team infect the blood with E. coli, salmonella, and strains of bacteria that cause dysentery, none of the germs survive. The alligator blood behaves almost like disinfectant, killing everything they throw at it. There are no significant differences between the sample from the zombie and blood found in healthy alligators. The investigators have drawn another blank. But they still have the live specimen caught on the lake. That is where the team focus next. The zombie alligators drag their limbs as if they have no control over them, seemingly incapable of movement or thought. 
Perhaps the messages just aren't getting through from the brain. Time to examine the nervous system. Some of the signs that we saw did suggest some neurological problems, and that became our next suspect. The anesthetized animals are taken to the lab. Electrodes are inserted into the skin near major nerves. Using a series of small electrical charges, the scientists stimulate each nerve in turn. Healthy animals react predictably and rapidly by twitching the part of the body controlled by that particular nerve. But the reaction time in the zombie alligators is much, much slower and far more unpredictable. The team are onto something. The problem is rooted in the gator's nervous system. It's just that they have no idea what it is. It's very unusual to see sick adult alligators in the wild. And unless they're beating up on each other, there's really not much else that's going to hurt an adult alligator. A year after the first death, the mortality rate is 10 times greater than normal and still rising. It has got to the point where there are too many bodies for the investigators to deal with. All they can do is mark them to show they've been counted, then leave them to decay. It was a horrible sight out there to see some of the gators turned up. And they would come by and they'd spray paint them, paint them red, and that means that they'd had a count, a body count. But it was some awful big gators died during this period. You know, a dead reptile, especially one that weighs a thousand pounds, is pretty smelly. The lake carries the stench of death. The fishing had become very bad at that particular point. The water quality was terrible. Uh, the odor was there not only from the dying carcasses of the gator, but just the from the water itself. They've been here for millennia. Their aggressive lifestyle and aquatic habitat have forced them to evolve incredibly powerful immune systems. A shield against invading microbes. But now they're struggling for survival. And whatever is creating the undead is also attacking the unborn. but the rest of them look like they haven't developed at all. Investigators examining every aspect of the alligators' lives find that even the eggs are being affected. Hatch rates of alligator eggs on Lake Griffin have never been what we would consider optimum. We usually see 50 to 60 percent of the eggs hatching. We'd like to see 80 percent hatching. But instead of an increase, Woodward sees an alarming decline in the number of eggs that are hatching. We saw the hatch rates decline to less than 10%. Something is attacking the adult from the inside, killing both the parent and the embryo. The outlook for Lake Griffin and its alligators is bleak. The team are no further forward with the investigation. The bodies of the animals reveal nothing. The blood tests nothing. And though the neurological tests proved positive, there is still no reason why the symptoms are occurring. Woodward and his team remain mystified and frustrated. They decide there is only one place left to look inside the alligator's brain. Really based on the observations of the biologists that had seen these animals alive, some of the, the clinical veterinarians that had done some of the tests, we knew that the brain was probably where we wanted to look. And uh, so we began to focus more and more on that tissue. The brain of an alligator is protected by a thick skull 
and tough skin. An alligator is a tough animal, and, and the skull on these animals is very thick. It takes some expertise and, and some special equipment to get into the brain. Not to mention brute force. But the operation is more delicate than it looks. For us to look at it under the microscope, the brain's got to be virtually intact. It's a very small piece of tissue, and really we can't afford to damage it during the removal process. This tiny piece of tissue is the alligator's brain. Weighing just eight grams, it is no bigger than its eye. But this tiny organ could hold all the answers to this mystery. Once the brain is removed, the pathologists divide it into sections, distinct parts that they send away for processing. When we look at the brain with our eyes, we don't see anything. It's not until we have those molecular tests and those virus tests and the microscope that we can really start to make inroads into what's going on. Pathologists place tissue samples on a slide to be scrutinized under a high-powered microscope. These microscope slides contain a slice of brain tissue that is basically one five thousandth of a millimeter in thickness. So we're able actually to look at it at very high magnification. Light passes through the tissue and what we see is really a sea of pink that is normal brain tissue. But look closer and a series of complex patterns comes into view. Though these appear random, the trained observer can spot abnormalities. Eventually, one scientist, Dr. Shobe, starts to notice that some areas of the brain appear to be a lighter pink than normal. When Dr. Shobe looked at these tissues, he began to notice that in a specific area of the brain, the neurons, the, the cells that actually transmit the nervous signals, were dying and dead. There were areas of the tissue that were, that were almost ghost-like. We see a pallor or paleness where the tissue has literally dropped out and died. We're also able to go down at a thousand times magnification and see individual neurons that have died. They've become shrunken and shriveled. Shobe and his team begin by observing what appears to be a normal brain with active neurons, blue in color, with a darker nucleus inside. But then they start noticing some that are bright pink with no nucleus. The neurons here are dead. It's very obvious under the microscope that those cells are no longer functioning. And when they check the sample, they see it comes from the area of the brain that controls movement and balance. Suddenly, the symptoms make sense. Without those neurons, or with abnormal neurons, you can't transmit the signals that, that give you coordination, that, that allow you to swim appropriately. And these animals were basically, um, they were swimming without steerage. In fact, the brain damage explains all the symptoms. The disorientation. The loss of balance. The nerve damage. And the drownings. Portions of the alligator's brains are dying while the animals continue to live. This is the breakthrough the team have been waiting for. Real concrete evidence at last. But they're still no closer to finding a culprit. Nearly 100 of Lake Griffin's alligators have now died. Many have become zombies. Holes in the brains reveals the cause of the deaths, but the identity of the attacker remains a mystery. The investigators turn their attention to the quality of the water in the lake. 
The St. John's River Water Management District is assigned to test the lake. Overseeing the task force is Jeff Elledge. What happened in Lake Griffin is that uh, man's activities caused that lake to deteriorate rather rapidly over the course of two or three decades. Lake Griffin was once a backwater, peaceful and tranquil, a safe haven for a broad array of wildlife. But then 20th century life encroached. Wildlife was replaced by people, vegetation by housing. With people comes pollution. People often think of a wastewater plant, you know, where the sewage goes as the, the pollution source, but it's only one of many possible sources. When a homeowner puts fertilizer on their lawn and irrigate their lawns, or when rain hits that lawn, part of that fertilizer is washing off into the lakes. The attraction of living here is to have a property that backs onto the lake. Local residents pamper gardens that stretch right down to the water's edge. Fertilizers and pesticides are sprayed. Chlorine is used in swimming pools. Marine fuel in pleasure boats. Yet homeowners are not the only possible culprits. Pollution can come from agriculture. They use fertilizer as well. They need that to grow crops. Since the 1940s, canals were dug and huge tracts of marshland around the lake were drained and used intensively for agriculture. They were known locally as muck farms. What a muck farm is, it's a farm that is on very organic soils. And the muck is actually vegetative material that is uh, degrading. It's a very black, kind of oozy material, and it was very productive for agriculture. One huge compost heap, perfect for growing crops. But to ensure its productivity, it was augmented with pesticides and fertilizers. Over 50 years, tons of these pollutants were pumped directly into the lake. In the 1990s, mug farms were phased out. Many of the pesticides they used had been banned by the US government years before. But their legacy lives on. The pollutants lie dormant, wrapped up in the soils, slowly seeping back into the lake. They aren't being used anymore, but they last a long time. Some of these may last 50 years or even longer in the environment. Could this concoction of chemicals slowly seeping into the lake have something to do with the alligator deaths? No one was sure what was causing it, but it was an indication there was something wrong in the environment. You know, alligators have been around for millions of years. You know, they're tough. But then all of a sudden we started to see these big mature alligators die. You know, that's an indication that we're really in some kind of environmental trouble. In an attempt to assess the extent of the damage, water samples are taken from across the lake. We went out and actually measured the pesticide levels in the soils in the farms, and we also measured it in the water in the lake and the water going from the farms to the lake to see if those pesticides could still be there. The investigators test for more than 50 of the most likely toxic substances. But when the results come through, the findings are uncanny. The pesticides that were of concern were pretty tightly bound to the soils. And they were either in the sediments or they were still in the farms in the soils, but they weren't getting into the water column. Pesticides and contaminants are present on the land surrounding the lake, but none of them seem to be finding their way into the water in any great amount and they aren't finding their way into the alligators either. 
All the tests we ran showed that pesticide levels were moderately low. And they weren't any different than any other time that we've ever measured pesticides on alligators in Lake Griffin. So nothing had really changed in terms of concentrations we were finding in alligators. The liver, the kidney, the blood, all sort of pointed us away from pesticides or lead poisoning or mercury poisoning. So we had to look for other causes of brain damage. But the water samples reveal something else astonishing. The water of Lake Griffin is teeming with an alien species of microscopic algae. The algae are not visible to the naked eye, but it is in the lake in unusually high concentrations. And that raises alarm bells. We were seeing the appearance of certain algae that produce toxins. They call them cyanobacteria or cyanotoxins, and uh, they're poisons. When these tiny blue-green algae die, they release a cocktail of chemical toxins, toxins that are well known for attacking the central nervous system. They can cause weakness, paralysis, brain damage, and even death. At last, the press has a culprit to blame. And the trail of evidence heads straight back to the muck farms. Activities around the lake, agricultural activities, development activities, caused a flushing of nutrients into the lake. Nutrients are something that animals and plants need for survival, but in large amounts, they cause a richness or a density in the lake that triggers a change in the ecosystem. These nutrients are saturating the lake to such an extent that suddenly blue-green algae run wild. And so we went from a lake that was much lower in nutrient levels but had good populations of vegetation in the lake to a lake that was dominated by algae. Once the algae take hold, there is no way back. They become the driving force of the lake, overwhelming, choking, suffocating. Less competition means more nutrients for the algae. They become unstoppable. But as they die, they release neurotoxins into the water, and neurotoxins kill neurons. Over two years into the investigation, mortalities now in their hundreds, the team finally have a prime suspect. But once again, the evidence fails to support the theory. The investigations show that there were no cyanotoxins in the alligators, at least not in any concentration that could be harmful. It's another frustrating conclusion to a promising lead. But there is to be one final twist. A chance encounter at a scientific conference in Maryland leads the Lake Griffin scientists to a compelling piece of evidence. One of our colleagues was talking with Dale Honeyfield. They got to mentioning the types of work they were doing and he mentioned that they were dealing with a salmon mortality event. Honeyfield is heading up an investigation into abnormal deaths of salmon and trout in the Great Lakes. They started comparing notes and found out that some of these clinical signs that they were seeing were very similar. Honeyfield's salmon appear to be suffering from a neurological disorder just before they die. He first notices the symptoms among the baby fish, or fry. The fry would hatch, but then shortly after hatch, before they swam up to, for their first feeding, they would die. Like Woodward and his team, Honeyfield had trouble identifying the cause. We could not find any relationship with contaminants, with bacterial or viral infections, 
uh, they were just they were just dying. They seemingly were healthy otherwise. But as he studies more adult fish, Honeyfield begins to see bizarre behaviors, just like those seen in the Lake Griffin alligators. They lost equilibrium, rolled over, and sank to the bottom of the tank. This footage from the time of the experiment shows that Honeyfield now has fish that can't swim. This leads him to test for neurological disorders, which takes him directly to the brain. He finds lesions, tiny holes in the salmon's brain, very similar to those found in the alligators. Areas of dead and dying nerve cells, now transmitting much slower chemical signals. But what is causing it? Honeyfield spends the next six years trying to find out. Having found no evidence of disease or pollution, he decides to look not for something that is there, but for something that isn't. Could the disintegration of the brain be caused by the animal lacking an essential substance? He begins a series of tests where he doses the lethargic salmon with a variety of chemical substances. One particular substance called thiamine has a profound impact. When fry are affected, they're lethargic, they lay on the bottom of the tank, similar to what we see right here. It may not be real clear, but there's hemorrhaging around the gill and pericardium region. If you look at normal fry, they're up swimming in the, in the water column, just as these are. They look bright, they're healthy, and if you take those fish that are in the previous slide and treat them with thiamine, within uh, approximately an hour, they will be all back up in the water column. It's like magic. This footage from Honeyfield's lab, shot at the time of the experiments, shows fish that were once close to death, suddenly healthy again. Once the thiamine gets into their bodies, then they resume normal function. The results are miraculous. Honeyfield has successfully pinned all the symptoms on a simple lack of thiamine, a natural substance otherwise known as vitamin B1. In a healthy body, there is a constant turnover of cells. They die and are replaced. But brain cells are much slower to regenerate, and without thiamine, the body lacks the energy to replace them. Vitamin B is essential for proper function of neurons. It actually protects the neurons, those cells in the brain that transmit the signals. And it actually has a function in producing the neurotransmitters, the chemical signals in the brain. So without thiamine, not only do you get abnormal neuron function, but you also, the cells themselves can die. The holes found in the brains of the fish match those in the alligators. It was almost unbelievable that, you know, here they were in this, uh, what a lot of people believed to be a very polluted lake, uh, what a lot of people believed was probably a pesticide or some other nasty pollutant. And we're proposing that it's possibly a dietary deficiency, a, a nutrient deficiency, vitamin B. To test the theory, Terrell is asked to go back to the bodies. What I asked the folks in Florida to do was to send me some tissue samples of dead alligators and some healthy alligators so that I could look at the thiamine levels in their tissue. And what I found was that those alligators that were most impacted, that had neurological effects and, and motor skills that were most impacted, had the lowest level of liver and muscle thiamine. We had no idea that a thiamine deficiency could occur in a wild population. It was almost a crazy theory because how do these wild animals in a wild environment eating a natural diet have a vitamin deficiency? Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't make evolutionary sense, it doesn't make ecological sense. Although the lake has deteriorated, there is still plenty of food for the alligators. 
and there have been no new prey species introduced into the lake. So if the alligator's diet is to blame, just what is it that they are eating? The only way to find out is to find a live alligator and pump its stomach. A reinforced plastic pipe is clamped between the animal's jaws, then taped into place. It is undignified, but there is no long-term damage to the alligator. Fresh water is pumped into the gut while pressure is applied to the belly. The contents of the stomach come gushing out. Good job. Here we go. Over seven months, alligators are captured and all have their stomach contents examined. What the scientists find in test after test are the remains of one particular species. A fish called gizzard shad. Honeyfield, for one, is not surprised. From my previous work, I knew that gizzard shad were very high in, in thymonase. Thymonase is an enzyme that destroys thymine. The pieces of the puzzle are coming together. The alligators have a thiamine deficiency. The shad are known to contain the enzyme thiaminase, which destroys thiamine. Surely the shad must be the killer. We tested that theory by actually feeding some alligators in a research study, gizzard shad, to see if it affected their thiamine levels. The team captures seven alligators and place them in a disused alligator farm. Over the next 12 months, they feed them three times a week on an exclusive diet of shad. Blood samples are taken regularly and sent away for analysis. Slowly, the alligators fed on shad begin to change. They become lethargic, their back legs paralyzed. They barely move. The tests are turning the alligators into the living dead. They found that all the alligators that ate the shad eventually had reduced thiamine levels in their system. That experiment really um, supported our hypothesis. But the alligators have always eaten shad. So why is thiaminase only affecting them now? Gizzard shad numbers increased greatly and the other species were much lower. And so the biodiversity was less. And therefore the alligators did not have the opportunity of getting their vitamin pill in the form of these other animals. Usually alligators get enough thiamine from their other foods. Just as with Honeyfield's fish, it doesn't matter if they ingest thiamine ace from the shad, as long as they get regular thiamine to bring them back to normal. The problems occur when they eat gizzard shad almost exclusively. But the changing quality of the lake has brought about a massive increase in the shad, at the same time as a decline in other prey species, such as bass and bluegill. You know, a fish that survives very well on eating bottom sediments and algae is shad. Well, the shad population exploded. That fish is found in highly nutrient-rich lakes. It really likes those kind of conditions. The more shad there are, the worse the situation will get. The authorities take a radical step. They extract the shad from all 36 square kilometers of Lake Griffin. 
And so we had this project to remove gizzard shad. Well, when we started harvesting the gizzard shad out of Lake Griffin, and the water quality was improving in Lake Griffin, the alligators stopped dying. It took six years of intensive investigation by a team of scientists from 13 different agencies to arrive at this solution. But the shad are not solely responsible for this crime. The deaths were caused by each and every one of the suspects. Firstly, People and muck farms colonized the region. Bit by bit, drop by corrosive drop, their chemical concoctions seeped into the lake to start a chain reaction. This paved the way for a toxic alien invader, an algal bloom which almost suffocated the lake. It killed all the plants and caused huge numbers of fish to die out. But one species found the new rancid conditions ideal. The gizzard shad ran amok in the now turbid and stinking waters of Lake Griffin. A chain of events triggered inadvertently by people, agriculture and development ended in the death of hundreds of alligators and the demise of a lake. gizzard shad, the murder weapon, but definitely not the killer.